Welcome back to another instant reaction edition of the Night Report podcast. Joining me once again is Richie Schneider. Right, Richie, two days in a row, we get a interior offensive lineman transfer portal commit this time from former Minnesota offensive lineman Curtis Dunlap. He's been a guy that we've been involved with for over a month now. This guy's been in the portal, I think, since October. It seemed like he was a Texas lean, uh, but that seems to have changed in the past week or so. How did this one come together and how did he end up at Rutgers? Um, he actually visited Rutgers back in uh, late November against when the team took on Maryland. Um, that's a big reason why, like, when you see these signee videos, most of them don't have, like, a, a person behind it because they haven't visited it yet. But Dunlap did visit back in November. Um, they showed a ton of interest in him the minute he entered the portal. He's another massive guy along the trenches. I think he's listed 6'5", 360, 355, something like that. Um, he's got a yeah, he's at an IMG Academy down in Florida. He's got a lot of raw strength. Um, <clears throat> based on some of the people I've talked to already um, that have watched him back during high school, um, they said it's raw strength. He's a little heavy on his feet, but he's actually fixed that quite a bit since now since then. Um, but just just a huge guy that stuffs the interior of that line. So um, he's he's going to be a pretty decent get. It seems like for Rutgers. Yeah, he's a guy that's kind of the complete opposite of Siofani. Because he's the guy who had, a, you know, he was a highly recruited guy of IMG. He's a massive human being. He's got everything that you seem to want, but he hasn't had the production on the college level. He's also dealt with some injuries. Uh, it looks like he had an Achilles injury in 2020, or, right? Is that, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, prior to the 2020 season, he, uh, well, I should say, let's just start from the beginning of when he arrived. But red shirt in his first year, he had to get his weight under control. Second year, he started, I think, 10, 11, 12, even 12 games, maybe. I forget what the exact number was. Um, started 12 games at right guard for him. Uh, missed one game, the Iowa game, with an injury. Unknown what that injury was. I'm going to have to guess probably that was the Achilles injury, and that's why he missed all of 2020. Um, but ever since he came back from that injury, the Minnesota guys I've talked to have said he kind of hasn't been the same player. Like, he started the first two, three games for them. But then got benched like almost immediately and was a rotational guy in terms of uh, a backup and kind of just depth at that point for Minnesota. So, I mean, there is a little bit of concern there because Achilles injuries are no joke, especially on a body that's 6'5", 360, 355, whatever it is now. Um, so, so I mean, that's, that's very concerning from that aspect. And then on top of it, um, going back to the Texas thing you were talking about, it sounded like Texas was ready to take them. They were ready to go. They did a little bit more research or kind of just talking as a staff and they just at the end of the day figured out um, after talking to some of the guys down there, they just told me at the end of the day, they just didn't have room for him. And that's kind of part of what happened with the COVID year. So everyone gets that free year, ruined scholarship charts. And you're seeing that all, all around the country right now. So it could end up being a pretty good snag for Rutgers if he's fully recovered. That's probably the biggest concern I'd have right now. Yeah. I mean, I've never had an Achilles injury, but there's certain injuries that take, like you used to hear it with ACLs. ACLs, you can hear, you can heal from a lot quicker these days. But yeah. it used to be, you, you're not right again until the fall, not the season you return, but the year after you return. And maybe Achilles injuries are like that, where you really need that extra year to really reacclimate your body to those movements. Because I mean, you're putting a lot of strain on that that lower leg. So <laughs> you got to hope if you're a Rutgers fan, which we both are, that. <laughs> what's actually going to happen this year is that he's going to be fully healthy and he's going to have better coaching and he's going to be, he's going to finally cash in on all of his potential. Because I mean, if you look at what he did in high school, he was a, a mammoth, mammoth, mammoth kid and he's got the size and presumably the skill to be a really good guard. I mean, it, it, he's also got a, there's a ton of connections between Rutgers and this Minnesota program. And at the end of the day, you're, you're kind of crazy. If you don't think Greg at least reached out to PJ and was like, PJ, What's the scoop? I like, obviously we're conference rivals at this point, but I'm sure PJ probably gave him like the, the inside info. Not maybe you don't have to go crazy in depth, but uh, on top of that, Harris Simiak, who just came over. I was going to say, team, yeah. Yeah. has probably dealt with him too. And then there was Panagos who was on staff. So I'm sure they've, they've been talking about this as a group all together for quite some time. And uh, Rob Smith was there too. So, I mean, they all, they all kind of probably know a lot about this kid enough to uh, obviously weren't taking him. And I mean, that Texas was very, very close. If not, God, they were very close. Just put it like that. They were very close to taking him and didn't. So, I mean, it's not a bad kid at the end of the day. Maybe he won't, he wouldn't have started at Texas. Maybe he wouldn't have contributed a ton. Probably would have been a depth guy, but comes to Rutgers and he probably has a really good chance to start. And uh, I think he was, before he got injured, he was 
all Big Ten honorable mention in 2019. So <clears throat> he has a shot. So you, do you think uh, Dunlap's the kind, of, the kind of guy that if he's healthy, he steps right in and plays and starts from day one at one of the guard guard spots? The guard position is so bad at Rutgers. I expect it right away. <laughs> yeah, because he, he does have something that none of our other uh, current players at guard have, and he has – massive size like he's going to be he's going to look like a big 10 offensive guard whereas most of the guys you know the ireland browns of the world who are converted d tackles are undersized and it's part of the reason they struggled yeah i mean this this entire offensive line just grew a ton over the past week and a half two weeks whatever it was um yeah maybe mike stefani one of the other recent transfers isn't huge i think he said he told me last night i think he's 290 295 Six three, but JD Dorenzo six six three fifteen. Um, Curtis Dunlap six five three forty five three fifty. Uh, you're gonna have Holland Pierce on the right side. It was six seven. I don't even three hundred and thirty plus. And then you got Raekwon O'Neal. So I mean, you you have a pretty decent line going into next year now. Now there's it's a little bit makeshift because you are adding transfers and it's gonna take time for these guys to gel. You can't expect them to do an overnight thing, but it does sound like all these guys are probably going to be here in spring and that's where it's going to be the huge developmental stuff. Um, DiVenzo, obviously there's only one year left, but, uh, Ciafani or Chifani, I forget how to say it exactly, but him and, uh, Dunlap have two years left. So now, or um, I'm sorry, Chif- Chifani has three years. Dunlap has two. So these are all guys that you're going to be able to develop for a, a little bit of time too. So it's not just like a one year fire. Yeah. And, I think we were both expecting multiple offensive linemen to come into this class. I I don't think I could have envisioned three. I mean, I also am not the coaching staff. They have clearly have a plan for all this. Do you think we're done in terms of offensive linemen from the portal, or do you think we would take more? Um, I was told they still want Willie Tyler. As of right now, the kid pushed his commitment back, I don't know, six times at this point. I think he died at 8.30 p.m., but on Eastern time. I think what central is an hour behind, right? Yep. Yeah. So he's supposed to decide at eight 30. I still expect him to go to SMU. It sounded like they got some kind of crazy NIL deal for him to kind of set up down there. So not too shocking there, but I think this is Rutgers trying to kind of take the news away from that. Cause it, everything with Greg is very strategic and he's kind of posting. He, if you notice, he kind of like these kids will commit. You'll notice sometimes like you'll, we'll have crystal balls and future cast in for him. And we, we kind of know already for the most part. And then all of a sudden, like, it's like they'll time it. So it's like Friday morning, boom, news break. Or wait, wait till Monday. Hold on. Wait till Monday. We're going to post it Monday, get you a ton of views. So I think this was kind of trying to not, not beat out another recruits uh, decision, but kind of to hide the fact that like you might've lost out one or lost out two or whatever. Yeah. It falls in line with how he's handled things in the past. I hear you. Yeah. Like that's why you put that, there's what news items on the one day, and that's all everyone talked about for one day was Rutgers hired Harris Simiak, Rutgers hired Watson, Rutgers got Sean Ryan. It's like holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Like get them talking about Rutgers as much as possible. So it's interesting. Yeah, so I know that a lot of times uh, with high school recruits, there's a very like defined timeline. Like you know they're announcing on their birthday, or they're going to announce at this uh, bowl game, or just something where you know that there's an event. Was mm-hmm. this uh, one of those transfer kids where, like, he could have committed at any point? It was just really when it was convenient for him, and that's kind of why it just came out of nowhere? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was actually in the middle of eating dinner. I was kind of a little upset at that <laughs> one. It is what it is. Um, yeah, I mean, this this one, we, we've been posting on the boards for, what, I want to say two, two and a half, three weeks now, that they're, they were still in it for Dunlap. They're still in it for Dunlap. Texas might not take them. Texas might not take them. And then all of a sudden, boom, I guess he probably, he probably got the – the call or Shiano basically maybe, maybe even Shiano called. We're, we're waiting to hear back from him right now. I know Patty's supposed to reach out to him in the next couple minutes or so. So we'll have an article up soon on his quotes and stuff, but I, I could see Shiano reaching out to him via car kid, like shit or get off the pot. That's it. Like either commit or don't. Otherwise we'll go find someone else. And that's, that's kind of been his whole, uh, his whole mantra in terms of recruiting in general to either commit to us or we'll find someone that's just as good, if not better. Yep. And so do you think if we don't land Willie Tyler, we're set at offensive line unless a really high level guy that the staff's super interested in comes along? Because it seems like all the guys who are going to transfer out after the season have done it now. You saw the wave of Georgia guys and Alabama guys after the title game, literally like 
the clock hit zero and it seemed like there was 10 guys in the portal from those two teams. So until yeah, spring that- practice is over, the, the, the pool of players is pretty much set at this point. I would like to think so, but I, I do think when the spring roster comes out, this is when we tend to notice a couple of left without telling anybody. So like, I, I guess you don't have to announce anything, but at the same time, there's also kids that like, will put it, put their name in the portal and not put a contact info, stuff like that. It gets, it gets really tricky. So I do think when we get that spring roster, you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, Holy shit. Like that kid's gone. That kid's gone. That kid's gone. That kid's gone. And maybe they just, maybe some of them are just not in the football anymore. I can name a couple of players on there that didn't seem too into it. Um, I want to say two years ago when Shiana first came on board, it just seems like they kind of were done with it. And the story, they move on, they move on from football in general. So I, I do think you're going to see a, an interesting roster come spring. Um, in terms of transfers, I, there might be some kids that see the first, <laughs> first depth chart and just be like, all right, fuck this. I'm out. <laughs> there might be others that will wait all the way to the end of spring. And some of them, a lot of them actually have to graduate still. So in order to get that, that grad transfer right there you want to get you want to get your degree get your degree then go so that's another reason why you might not see kids enter their names until after spring and they might even enter their name and be like yeah but i can't enroll till may or whatever or june be like a steven stolano so over at uh, lafayette he, he wants to go somewhere and commit but he's still kind of in the process of uh graduating so Gotcha. Yeah, because it looks like from from the kids we started following, at least on social media, roughly 70, 75 percent of them have landed somewhere or they've decided to return. So and it looks like we're starting to slow down in terms of the guys we've started following. So I, I think we might be inching towards a close of this window of transfers, if I had to guess. Um, at least break. Jeez, man, it's it's nonstop. Yeah. So I think if we were to see more, it would probably be another receiver possibly and a linebacker we've gone we've kind of looked into a lot of linebackers we've offered a couple are you hearing anything on the wide receiver or linebacker front or is this all just like when it comes it comes um it, it changes daily um at the moment there's no specific names i know isaiah alston ones that we one that we talked about i think he's like top 10 you had him pff it was rated or something yep um yeah he, he's going back to army um there's another kid that's going back to army too which which is kind of interesting i think like as a wide receiver, do you, do you really want to play in that army offense, especially if you're good enough to play in like a power five offense, mm-hmm. whatever he made his decision, he's going back to army. Um, that's the only name we've, we're really like dug deep into. Um, other than that, there's obviously Willie Tyler who's still on the board for now. I don't know what the hell's going to happen in an hour. Uh, it sounds like SMU, but that could also change that kids changed his mind quite a bit as well. Um, if, if they somehow had him, Greg basically just redid his entire offensive line, which yeah. would be pretty nutty. Which is exactly what we needed too. I mean, we all yeah. saw this offensive line it was one of the worst in the Power Five last year. We we needed to have at least something competent in front of Gavin Wimsat this year, or else. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many big shots did did Noah Vedral take this year? And just because he's one of the toughest players I can remember watching in a Rutgers uniform, he kept trotting himself out there. But Gavin I, does not have the frame to do that. Like, no, it was pretty thick. I, I was talking to someone about this today, and that's and if you don't protect Gavin, it's it could get ugly real quick. And you might be right back at Vedral, you might be Evan Simon, and then you're down to two scholarship quarterbacks. And then it's like, holy shit, what are what did we do? Yep. We'll see. I that's that's one position I don't am pursuing in the portal, but it does sound like linebacker and wide receiver to go back to your original question. It sounds like wide linebacker, wide receiver, the two top priorities, along with tight end, where Steven Stolanos is down yep. to Syracuse. Uh, that's basically just a waiting game at that point, too. That could be tomorrow for all I know. Sure. One quick thing before we go. Uh, the new schedule got released today. Any big surprises for you there? It looks like the out-of-conference stuff stayed locked into the first three weeks of the season. Uh, what do you think about the new schedule for Rutgers? you like it more or less for the for the team? Um, I like it more for the sole fact that they're making – trying to push Maryland Rutgers to be the rivalry. I think we actually talked about this before not too long ago. Um, I think that's what they should be doing in the first place. Uh, stop playing Penn State Rutgers at the end of the year. Um, let Penn State do their land grant trophy game against Michigan State. Now make it Rutgers and Maryland a trophy game. I don't care if you make it a crab or a highway sign or whatever the hell you want to do, but just just do something. This has to be like a rivalry. It's geographically it makes sense. Both programs are starting to hate each other. Maybe that's solely because of uh, Finau over at uh, Maryland, who is coming oh, back yeah. first. Is it? You saw that news. So Noah Vedral's ankle, a full more year. 
or maybe Gavin Winstead. But uh, yeah, there, it seems to be like there's a little bit of hatred. I do like to think that Rutgers, Michigan, Rutgers, Michigan State has more hatred towards each other, especially after the whole I'm stealing your chop logo, all that stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, I do think um, Rutgers, Maryland could eventually be a rivalry game and it should and should be played on rivalry week each year, make it a thing. Other than that, um, I'm kind of glad they didn't touch the out of conference. I'm actually super glad because I already have my trip booked for Boston College. So don't touch that one. Um, yeah, other other than that, I'm I'm just looking at it now. It's it's still a very tough schedule at the end of the day. Yep. I don't I don't know how they're gonna fare it when it comes to um we, we don't I guess I don't know what the team looks like fully yet. And until then I can't really comment on like a prediction or anything like that. But it, it is a very tough schedule. You're playing Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota as your Big Ten West opponents. Minnesota's off one of their best years ever, in recent history at least. Iowa's Iowa, and Nebraska, despite only having three wins, is still a pretty damn good program. No quarterback at the moment with Adrian Martinez gone, but I'm sure they'll figure that one out. Scott Frost is pretty good with QBs, it seems. Other And then the rest, the Big Ten East schedule is just – it's a dogfight. It's not even fun anyway. <laughs> Yeah, just to run through it really quick before we head out. It's uh, the opening game is uh, the third of September at Boston College. The first home game is uh, September 10th versus Wagner, and then we go on mm -hmm. the road to Temple the 17th, and then we have a home game against Iowa on September 24th. The following week, we play at Ohio State October 1st, and we wrap up the first half of the schedule with a home game versus Nebraska on October 8th. We have a bye the 15th, and then we play versus Indiana on October 22nd on the road versus Minnesota on October 29th, then at home versus Michigan on November 5th, then on the road versus Michigan State at or November 12th, home versus Penn State November 19th, and then we finish up the season at Maryland on Thanksgiving weekend, uh, November 26th. So it's definitely a tougher schedule than this year, but I do think that we got some lucky, uh, not lucky, but we got some fortunate changes in terms of, you know, we have a break in the middle of the season now and doesn't seem as daunting front loaded of the schedule. No, yeah, most definitely. I had the last three, three out of the last four to five. It's like, ah, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> that's a brutal stretch. And it seems like that's the same four teams we play every year around that time. Yep. At least they spaced out Ohio State a little bit, but Ohio State, Iowa back to back is not pretty. You're yep. probably going to get a little bit by those two. And then Nebraska is Nebraska at the end of the day, but they're, they're not a bad team. So, uh, it's gonna the first game is basically your witness test if you had to pick one. It seems like BC is gonna be that witness. Beat them, great. If not, I I don't I don't know where what where the season's gonna go. Yeah, they're they're losing a lot of impact players too, but they have a pretty good quarterback in Phil Jerkovich, so it's gonna be a yeah. tough game. It's gonna but, be fun to watch that much. For sure. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning in to another instant reaction episode of the Night Report podcast. We're signing off. See you next time.